Good evening. Good evening, saints. Welcome to our virtual Bible study. I'm glad you're able to join us tonight. I pray your heart is prepared to uh, dig into the word of God. And I, I pray that, of course, always when we get into the word, uh, there is a corresponding blessing that the Lord has in store for us. Amen. And Psalm 19 talks about how the word of the Lord is perfect. It restores the soul. The word of the Lord uh, is enlightening. It rejoices the heart. And so we're looking forward to digging deep into the scriptures tonight. Uh, before we do so, just want to update you on some prayer concerns. Um, well, let me just give a, yeah, let's go to the prayer concerns tonight. There's a, a number of uh, prayer requests uh, just received before Bible study tonight uh, and on, on yesterday as well. We want to be praying uh, for Pastor Joseph Owens of Shiloh Baptist Church. I had a conversation with him yesterday and he stated that he's going in for back surgery on tomorrow. So if you can please be in prayer for Pastor Owens over at Shiloh having back procedure on tomorrow. Uh, Mother Curtis, Mother Alice Curtis fell uh, recently and broke two fingers. And so asking for prayer, she's doing well, but just praying, just praying for her and the family uh, as, she's, as she's recuperating. Uh, had a conversation with Mother Clark and just want to update you on Sister Tanja. She's still in the hospital. So be in prayer for her uh, as she's recovering, okay? Uh, also Deacon Al Johnson, we were at the funeral. My wife and I were at the funeral of uh, of his sister today. We had a homegoing celebration up in Louisville. So please be in prayer for Deacon Al, uh, beloved sister, older sister, passed away uh, last week, had the funeral services on today. Uh, so please be in prayer for the Johnson family. Sister Charlotte Holman, uh, death of her sister-in-law, Bridget Bradshaw, asking for prayer for the family. Uh, so please uh, lift just a home and the family up before the Lord. And Deacon Paul Price, now Friday, last Friday, uh, he had his back surgery. And so he's been on a walker. Uh, but we heard today from his lovely wife that he greeted her at the door without a walker. So he is walking slowly. He's improving slowly. We bless the Lord for that. Mm -hmm. And we bless the Lord for his grace and his progress. Amen. Amen. Um, also, we want to be praying for Sister Ruth Gibson. She is improving. So we got a, a message from uh, her sister and Ruth is walking. She's able to walk uh, from her bed to the bathroom unaided. Mm -hmm. uh, she's doing well in her speech. And so uh, according to uh, those who assist her at the, at the facility, that uh, she's doing everything that's expected of her. And so we're praying that God would just move and allow her to just, just really bounce back fast. Uh, pray that her insurance will continue to provide uh, the cost for uh, her rehab. So please be in prayer for her in that regard. Uh, also, Sister Vanessa Connor uh, told me on yesterday her son had, had his surgery and it went well. So we bless the Lord for that. Uh, yesterday, we had the homegoing celebration, uh, Sister Ann Carol Miller. And so be praying for uh, Brother da Derek and Valerie Lindsay. Uh, beautiful tribute on yesterday. Uh, Boy, you know, I, I just learned so much about some of the saints just through the testimonies of, of the saints. And so just to know that uh, Sister Anne, a faithful member of uh, 78 years. So she joined Main Street when she was 11. You know what I mean? Under Pastor Gibson all the way up to me. So uh, what, a, what, a, what a joy to, uh, to have had that history and that faithfulness in our church. And so be in prayer for the family and, as, uh, and the church overall as, as we move forward. So please lift these up. Uh, before the Lord. Um, I believe that is all that we have at this time. So uh, let's pray and lift these uh, requests up before the Lord, and then we will go forth with our Bible study. Father, we bless you tonight, and we lift up to you these names that I've mentioned. We are so grateful that you are a God that is ever present. David said in Psalm 139, verse 7, if I go to heaven, you are there. If I ascend to the grave, you are there. And he was overwhelmed with the thought that there's nowhere he can flee from your presence. Mm -hmm. And so, Lord God, you are always with us. You're with those who have died in Christ. You're with Sister Ann Carol Miller. You're with Sister Mary Ella Wood, uh, Deacon Al's sister. You're with uh, Deacon Taylor. You're with Sister Helen Coleman. And you're also with the families, Lord God. And we pray that you would be a comfort to them. And Lord, we also pray for your healing mercies to be upon Sister Ruth Gibson and Mother Alice Curtis. 
Uh, we also pray for your healing grace to be upon Vanessa Connor's son, as well as Paul Price, uh, Sister Tanja Cummings. We pray for your grace to be with Pastor Owens on tomorrow, that his surgery will be a success. Uh, and Lord, we pray again for comfort to the families, uh, Sister Charlotte Holman and her family and the passing of her sister-in-law. We lift these up before you tonight, Lord, and I know that each and every one of us have a prayer concern. And I, I, I'm so grateful, Lord God, that you hear us, whether we verbalize it or in our hearts, and even when we can't verbalize it, we're so grateful, as we learned on Sunday, for the Holy Spirit's intercession as he prays to Jesus on our behalf, and Jesus talks to the Father so the Father can work it all out for our good. So we bless you, Lord. We thank you that we're covered uh, in Christ by the Spirit, and Lord God, we're being taken care of by you, Heavenly Father. So guide us tonight. Guide us in your word. Revive us in the scripture. And I pray, oh Lord God, that you would help us to grow in the grace and knowledge of you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. We've got a praise report from Sister Vanessa. It says, thank you, Pastor Shola and Main Street for praying for my son, Jerome. He had a successful angiogram of his heart and did not require a stent or surgery. To God be the glory. Amen. amen. Thank you, Vanessa, for that. Amen. 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 All right. Well, now we're going to turn it over. To BB and CC. Less more. Athena Sholar to lead us in a song of worship.
more thank you sister athena sholar oh how i love jesus you know that uh, that lyric why because he, he first loved me that's out of first john 4 19 right we love him because he first loved us and that uh you know i i failed to mention on sunday as we're going through the study on uh when the spirit speaks and out of first corinthians chapter 12 verse 3 and paul makes mention no one's speaking by the the spirit of god says jesus is a curse uh, at the end of 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 22, Paul says this statement, if anyone does not love the Lord Jesus Christ, may he be a curse. So, so loving God, the greatest, the greatest commandment is to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And so to break the greatest commandment is to commit the greatest sin. And so Paul is saying, if anyone does not love Jesus, may they be a curse, may they be judged, may they be sent to hell. Uh, that's that's a serious statement, amen. And so every true born again believer loves Jesus, and we realize we love Jesus only in response to Him first loving us, amen, amen. amen. Uh, in light of that, there are a couple of questions, and, and of course, uh, as we start up our Bible study tonight, if you have any questions and you have your video on, you can wave your hand. If you don't, uh, you can enter in your question into the chat, and we'll do our best. Uh, to answer that, or again, you can send me an email and uh, email me a question. Uh, I do want to make mention to Sister uh, Lynn Green that I have received uh, a couple of your emails that you sent. I don't know why, for some reason, they go into the spam. Spam, and I looked those up and and I saw uh, your statements. I appreciate that, and thankful that you got clarification from last week's study uh, on the issue of the Word Faith Movement. And uh, Les is quick to upload those Bible studies, so I'm glad you're able to track along. Uh, there was a follow-up, and I, if you don't have any questions, there were a couple of questions that were posed to me. Uh, one, in, uh, in response to the sermon on this past Sunday, again, out of 1 Corinthians 12, we're going through this sermon series of how the Holy Spirit moves in the church. And the question was, uh, I always believe or I thought that Jesus, when he died, that he did go to hell. Now, uh, this is where we get in. Oftentimes, you might read something, and if you have the King James translation, uh, there is a translation of a Greek word that is translated hell. And if you have your Bibles tonight, you can open up and turn with me to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, verse 31. Acts chapter 2 verse 31. And, I, and I'll explain this text, and then we'll deal with the difference between what Peter is saying here on the day of Pentecost and what the word faith teachers are saying as it relates to Jesus going to hell. Now, uh, Peter is quoting 
Psalm 16. And he sees Psalm 16 as a prophetic psalm written by David. And David mentions in that song, Thou will not abandon my soul to Hades, nor allow thy holy one to undergo decay. Then he says in verse 31, he connects that. He looked ahead. David looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of Christ, that he was neither abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh suffer decay. Hades in the Greek literally means not seen, not seen. And again, Peter's quoting from the Greek translation of the Old Testament referred to as the Septuagint. Yeah, I don't know if you ever saw the Greek uh, letters LXX. If you ever seen in the front of your Bible uh, or a commentary, uh, you know, have, they have sort of the, uh, the abbreviations for you. You might look down and see LXX and then adjacent to it, you, you'll see what it means, a Septuagint. And that's simply the Greek translation of the Old Testament. LXX means 70. And there were 70 men that translated uh, the Hebrew Old Testament to Greek. Now, remember, and there's a history behind this. I won't get into too much of it. But remember, when Israel was in Babylonian captivity, they were there for 70 years, 70 years. When they came out of Babylonian captivity, uh, many of them had lost their Hebrew dialect, their ability to speak their natural tongue, their native tongue of Hebrew. Many of them began to speak Aramaic slash Greek. So during the time of our Lord, uh, they spoke Aramaic, they spoke Greek, and therefore, and some not being able to read the Hebrew Bible, only the Pharisees and the scribes, they were the Gamer Gamerians, they were the ones that knew the language. Uh, even Paul would say, I'm a, I'm a Pharisee of the Pharisees. I'm a Hebrew of the Hebrews. I, I, I kept the language. But not, not everyone did. Not everyone was able to study the Old Testament scriptures uh, in the Hebrew uh, tongue. So you had the Greek translation. And Peter is a fisherman. He spoke Greek. So he would he would quote from that text. Now, if you go back to the Hebrew, it would say shield. Not, Thou will not abandon my soul to shield. That's the grave. Here he says, Thou will not abandon my soul to Hades. Now, in the Greek, there are two words that, uh, there, there, there's a word that is translated hell, and that's Gehenna. That's not the Greek word here, Hades. So the King James wrongly translated, that will not abandon my soul to hell if it's there. I don't have my parallel Bible with me. Uh, so Jesus did not have to go to hell. He did not go to hell for our sins. The atonement for our sins was achieved on the cross. That's why, again, you see a distinction in the prayer that Jesus offered up on the cross. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That's the only time Jesus prayed when he addresses the first person of the Trinity, the Father, and calls him God. That's the only time he calls him God. Why? Because he felt that alienation as our sins were upon him. But when he, when he atoned for our sins, when he covered our sins, when he removed our sins on that cross, he said, Father. Uh, he said, uh, it is finished. And then he said, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. So into thy hands I commit my spirit. So the son placed his spirit in whose hands? The father's hands, not the devil's hands. So he didn't go to hell. He went to heaven. Okay. Now, word faith teaches this concept of hell because they're, they, they believe, yeah, um, let me say this without getting angry. The... The, the doctrine of, uh, of the word faith movement is blasphemy, it's, it's heresy, it's, it's, it's anti-Christ, anti-Christian. And, and I say this, you know, because as a warning to you all, don't listen to any of them. Uh, they'll say some good stuff. That's what the devil does as well. He's a lying spirit. He'll say some good stuff and then he'll mix in uh, error uh, behind it. And so we got to be Bereans. We got to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. In the false doctrine of word faith teaching god is not sovereign when adam sinned god in the minds of the word faith teachers say that god lost authority over the world and so he had to find a way to get back into the world since the world now is controlled by the devil he had to sneak back into the world but he could not get into the world as far as his plan of redemption to go forward unless he was able to get someone that would agree uh, to uh, go along with his plan. And so he went with Abraham and Abraham was the only one that could assist him in taking back the world. 
And so Abraham, the covenant is there, and then you go forth, and then Jesus comes, and then we talked about last week this ransom theory concept that Jesus paid our sin debt to Satan, not to God, and we read Ephesians chapter 5, verse 2, which is clearly said Jesus offered himself up to God as a fragrant aroma, right? So he didn't offer himself up to the devil, but to God. But this whole ransom theory was, well, in order for you to get the world back, you got to pay a payment to me, the devil. And, and, and paying it to me, your son has to go to hell. And so in this whole mindset, hell is a realm that the devil reigns. And that's not true. Biblically speaking, the devil's not in hell. And the devil fears, as well as demons, they fear being put in that place. And if I had time, I could take you through all the scriptures on that. Uh, one is suffice the the account where the demons possessed a man in the gatherings and Jesus asked, what's your name? They said, Legion, for we are many. And they kept pleading with him, it says in the gospel account, not to send them into the abyss. The abyss is the prison. And Jesus permitted those demons to go into pigs and the pigs went uh, down into the water. So, uh, but uh, no, Jesus did not pay our sin debt in hell. And uh, we got to, I think it's always good if you don't have in your library, it's always good to have a parallel Bible, parallel Bibles, like maybe three to five various translations. You can kind of compare the translations. Uh, the King James, the 1611 is an older uh, translation. It's a good translation. Not every translation is perfect, but there's some sections that it can do better. That's why you have the new King James. And of course, you have the new American Standard and some other translations. If you ever have any questions about that, please uh, let me know. That's the first question. Second question that was asked, and you know, let me know if I'm going too fast, is, is there a correlation between this thought of Jesus going to hell and the Roman Catholic teaching of purgatory? There's really no correlation uh, in the teaching of the Roman Catholic doctrine of purgatory. Purgatory is an intermediate. It's the middle place between heaven and hell. And uh, during the Roman Catholic time, there was a... Uh, the Roman Catholic Church taught the importance of indulgences. Indulgences was money that the people would give to the church. The church would use that money uh, in the facilitation of building their great uh, monuments and cathedrals and church buildings and things of that sort. Uh, in order to get people to give faithfully uh, to, to, to the Roman Catholic Church, they taught this concept of purgatory that their loved ones um uh, did not fulfill the good works required in to go to, in order to go to heaven so they're in between heaven and hell and if you give indulgences to the roman catholic church the priest will pronounce a sort of release of that person's soul so imagine someone's telling you your mother's in purgatory she's not in heaven she's or your daddy or your son or your daughter or your grandchild uh, is in purgatory and you're you're overwhelmed with this sense of fear that a loved one is in purgatory burning if they're not burning to the degree that they would in hell but they're there suffering and you give some money to the church and they'll release them and there was a man that was sent throughout uh rome uh conning the poor a man named tinsel and he would say as soon as the coin in the cuff coffer rings a soul in purgatory springs and martin luther saw that and he was incensed this is why we're talking about what is reformed theology because that was a dark age of the church history uh luther saw that and he was hot because he said that's not even in the bible and he nailed to the door at wittenberg in germany his 95 theses his 95 protests against the roman catholic church and that's what we look to as the beginning of the reformation uh, so all that to say is that purgatory is not near to the concept of the word faith movement. It was just a lie propagated through the Roman church to take money from people to facilitate. You go to Rome, you look at all these beautiful buildings. <laughs> you know, where did they get it from? Poor people in fear uh, through lies. Okay, so I hope that's somewhat clear with that. If you have any more thoughts on that or further questions, please let me know. Uh, and then there was a, two other questions uh, Dr. Mark Bernard posed, and I want to address these. Number one, do you believe that someone has to believe in the Trinity in order to be saved? I would say yes. 
uh, let me explain, okay? Yes, you, you may not be able to art, understand, articulate the doctrine of the Trinity, but there's a sense where someone understands, hear me now, that when we talk about the gospel, we use terms that automatically give us, informs us that there is one God in three persons. So when we say the Son, we also know that Jesus is his name. He's also referred to as the Lord, the Word. Uh, we also know that one of his most frequent terms for himself is the Son of Man and the Son of God. So if he's a son, we know if you read your gospel accounts correctly, he taught to the Father. If you read the gospel accounts, we also know the Holy Spirit came upon him. So uh, I would say that a truly born-again believer, and I'll just use myself as an example of someone not raised in church, did not know terminology. If you asked me what the Trinity was, I would not be able to tell you what the Trinity is. But if you asked me, do you believe that Jesus, you believe the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, I would say yes, based on what I've been taught. So I would say it's important that a believer understands who God is. I believe that every true born-again believer, as we learned this past Sunday, that no one speaking about his Holy Spirit will say Jesus is cursed, and, and uh, no one can say Jesus Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So it's interesting when God saves you, the Holy Spirit saves you. He enables you, God, we, we say the Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit, who's God, enables you to acknowledge Jesus as God. And if he does that, then he also will enable you to affirm that the Father is God. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. He, he, he testifies in our hearts that we are children of God, and he testifies in our hearts who Jesus Christ is, and he takes us through the word, and he illuminates to us more and more and more who this great God is. Now, I'm not saying that the moment you get saved, you're going to understand the Trinity or be able to articulate it. Even to this day, none of us can really, all we can say is one God in three persons, right? Um, but no truly born again believer will reject the doctrine of who God is as revealed in three persons uh, in the Holy Scripture. Now, uh, that leads to the second question that Brother Mark Bernard asked, can someone believe in modalism and still be saved? And modalism is a denial of the Trinity. It's a denial of the three persons in one God. They would say it's not three persons, it's one person who has three roles or three modes. Uh, let me say it this way, that it is possible for any believer to be deceived. Or else we wouldn't have the warnings in the Bible, right? Do not be deceived uh, when it comes to thinking that someone could be a Christian and live a life of sin. We see that in 1 Corinthians 6, 8. Uh, no one who practices unrighteousness shall inherit the kingdom of heaven. Do not be deceived. Uh, now, if you turn with me to 1 John for a moment, let me just share with you two things that really answers both questions that were posed. Uh, 1 John chapter 2. We went through 1 John uh, a couple of years ago. And this is the epistle that if you were wondering about the assurance of salvation. Uh, John has those two tests. He has the doctrinal test and he has the moral test or the, the character test or the behavior test. First John chapter two, verse 18. We're going to just walk this for a moment. Uh, first John chapter two, verse 18. Children, it is the last hour, okay? Now, when you see last hour, John would say it. Uh, Paul would say we're in the latter times or in the last days. This is the time between Jesus' first coming and his second coming. So we're in the last hour, before the final hour of the Lord's return. Just as you heard the Antichrist is coming, right? Even now, many Antichrists have arisen. From this, we know this is the last hour. Antichrist can be, the, uh, can be uh, understood two ways. Anti meaning against, right? Against Christ, against the gospel. And anti, that preposition, can also be in place of. And we see both are, act, are acted out. You, you go to Revelation, the Antichrist will not only stand against Christ, but put himself in place of Christ. Okay? So many Antichrists are there. There are many who are against the gospel, right? Uh, they went out from us. How did they start out? They were, they were actually in the church. They went out from us, verse 19. Uh, they were not really of us. If they were of us, they would remain. Here it is, verse 20. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you all know. Who's the anointing? The Holy Spirit. So it's interesting that when Jesus 
when he on that night with his apostles in the upper room, he gives his upper uh, room discourse as referred to uh, from chapter 13 to chapter 17 of the Gospel of John. He says, uh, I, I will give you another helper. Another is of the same kind. As I was a helper to you, now that I'm going back to the Father, I'm going to send you another helper. Uh, one who, literally, one who's going to come alongside. Uh, some translations say a counselor or a, a helper or a comforter. And so the Holy Spirit functions in our life the same way uh, Jesus functioned in the life of the apostles. You just go back and read the gospel accounts. Every moment where we find Peter fearful, it was when he was outside the presence of Jesus. But when Jesus was around, he did some courageous things. You know, he, he was afraid in the boat. When we saw Jesus coming, he got out the boat, right? All the rest stayed in the boat. Um, when he uh, turned his eyes from Jesus, he sank. When he turned his eyes back on Jesus, you know, God, Jesus brought him back up, you know, and put him back in the boat. Uh, when he was with Jesus in the garden, when Judas came to arrest him with the Roman soldiers, Peter pulled out his sword, his little dagger, uh, his little switchblade, and was about to fight these Roman soldiers. Why? Because he was with Jesus. But soon as he was out of the presence of Jesus, he denied the Lord three times. And so Jesus says, I'm going to give you another helper. He won't just be with you. He'll be in you. Right? And so the helper, the Holy Spirit, functions in a number of ways. Number one, he convicts us of sin, draws us to Christ, enables us to believe in the gospel. That's, that's the initial work of the Spirit, salvation. In salvation... He illuminates the Bible to us that when you read the word of God and you read it faithfully, he will give you understanding. Uh, he will sanctify you. He'll give you desire to want to live out what you learn. Uh, he will convict you when you disobey the Father. Um, when you disobey Jesus, the Bible says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit for which you were uh, sealed unto the day of redemption. Don't quench the Spirit. How do you quench the Spirit? You quench the spirit by resisting the spirit's purpose in your life to make you more like Jesus. You grieve the spirit when you harbor sin in your life. And so Paul would say, let it all go. Let, lay it aside. It doesn't mean when he says bitterness and clamor and anger and wrath. It, it, it simply means lay aside the desire to want to retaliate against those who have hurt you. It doesn't mean let bygones be bygones and someone offends you and you just you don't seek to deal with that. It says don't respond to offenses in ungodly ways. That is grieving the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit, even in allowing you and I to be offended, wants us to respond in a gospel-like way. That's why the next verse says, be tenderhearted, kind, and forgiving, just as God in Christ has also forgiven you. So we have an anointing. Verse 21, uh, I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it and because no lies are the truth. Verse 22, who is the liar? But the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ. This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. There it is. Anyone who denies the Father and the Son is the Antichrist. Anyone who would deny the gospel or, or, and the, re, the revelation of God in the gospel of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is the Antichrist. So you see the Father and the Son. Now you got two persons there of the Godhead, and you already mentioned in verse 20, the third person, the anointing, right? Whoever denies, verse 23, the Son does not have the Father. So if you say, if someone says, I deny Jesus, I don't believe he's God. And as we have been covering in the study of Reformed theology, I mentioned, and you go back in your notes, of the Council of Nicaea in, in 325 an African, a North African by the name of Athanasius, defended the truth of the scriptures concerning who God is against the heresy of dynamic minarchianism, which said that Jesus was not God. Uh, but later on, he became God via adoption. And they said no. So when people say, well, the, 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 the doctrine of the Trinity was invented at the Council of Nicaea, it wasn't invented. It was defended. Okay. It was articulated. Uh, they took the scripture and they said, it's clear, there is persons within the Godhead, within the nature of God. There, there are persons within the nature of God. What do you mean, Pastor? You go back to Genesis 126, let us make man in our image. So we see God speaks within himself. 
and he and there's persons within himself to whom he is speaking. Then when Jesus comes, Jesus reveals to us the Father, right? Um, Gospel of John chapter 1, verse 18, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who's in the bosom of the Father has explained him. He explained him in his teaching. He explained him in his nature, in his character. Uh, we were talking about this last night, uh, uh, so, some of the young adults and, and less of myself, when, um, when Philip asked Jesus, show us the Father, John 14. He says, have I not been with you? He who seen me, he's seen the Father. I'm not the Father, but I possess the qualities of the Father, right? Um, uh, someone mentioned to me a while back, uh, I think it was Jennifer. I think it was Jennifer Cornelius. Uh, when Jonathan uh, uh, came to the church, she's like, and he looks just like you, you know, and, you know, yeah, I mean, so it's like, Jonathan can say, well, I wonder how your father looks. Well, he looks just like me. <laughs> he looks like me. I, I, I look like my daddy. I'm not my daddy, but there are characteristics that I have that resembles my daddy. That's, that's basically what Jesus is saying in John 14. So going back to 1 John, let me just conclude, let me conclude this point so that you'll understand in answering both questions, that within the gospel, the son, you cannot have the son without the father because the son talks about the father. And the gospel announces that if you confess Jesus Christ as Lord and believe that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. So we see persons are involved uh, in the work of salvation. Uh, each person has an involvement in salvation. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit are our Savior. So let me continue on verse 24. Uh, As for you, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and the Father. Verse 25, and this is the promise which he himself made to us, eternal life. These things I've written to you concerning those who are trying to deceive you. As for you, the anointing which you receive from him abides in you. Jesus said, if I go to the Father, the Father will send the Spirit. The Spirit came. He is the anointing. Anointing means that we have been specially endowed by the Holy Spirit, okay, to be kept, to be sealed unto the day of redemption. We are kept. That means we are kept. We will not uh, drift away from God into some heresy. We might be deceived. But I believe that every true born-again believer, once they are made aware of the truth, they will cling to the truth. That's the work of the Spirit. As for you, the Holy Spirit, the anointing which you receive from him abides in you, and you have no need for anyone to teach you. You don't need uh, the Antichrist to teach you. You don't need these Antichrists. You don't need to turn on TBN. Let me be real with you. Don't need to turn on TBN. Don't need to listen to Joyce Myers. Don't need to listen to T. Jakes or Joel Osteen. All of them, why are you calling out their names? Because all of them, all of them, uh, agree or are a part of the word faith movement. So all of their theology is the same. It's all heresy. It's all heretical. You know? And so you don't need them. You have the truth teacher in you. And you just need to open up your Bible and read the Bible and the truth teacher will teach you. You don't need, I remember years ago, uh, a false teacher by the name of Peter Popoff. And Peter Popoff uh, was actually exposed to being a charlatan and ripping people off and and uh, they said you know if you if you reach out to their ministry they'll send you this water this this holy water miraculous water whatever it was it was a little bitty thing probably toilet water all we know and uh yeah I, you know i didn't give them no money but they they you know they they i i, I want this water i, I said i'm gonna What's your water? <laughs> and uh, just, just, just to see just how, and then that, when they give you, quote unquote, this tap water, then they start uh, pushing you to give money, you know, and then they'll, then of course you send a prayer cloth and, and uh, the prayer cloth is, again, is supposed to be that which replaces you just going directly to the Lord. You, you can't get to the Lord, but the prayer cloth, right? You can't get to the Lord unless you get this holy water. Everything turns us away from the sun. That's what the Antichrist does. He turns us away from Christ and knowing that in Christ, he is my high priest and that I have, as what is referred to, and uh, Luther talked about this, as the priesthood of the believer. And the doctrine of the priesthood of the believer is that, that 
we don't need to go to the Pope to get our sins forgiven. Um, I can come boldly to the throne of grace, right? I can go to God by myself. Uh, and so, again, you don't need the Antichrist. You don't need false teachers to teach you the truth because you have the truth in you by virtue of the Holy Spirit's presence who will teach you the truth that he has written for us. So let me conclude this verse. And as for you, the anointing which you receive from him abides in you. You have no need for anyone that anyone is not meaning you don't need a pastor. And their gifts to the church, which we're going to see on Sunday, doesn't mean anyone in the sense you don't need a pastor, right? We, the anyone in the context here is referring to these antichrists. But as his anointing teaches you about all things and is true and not a lie, like the Antichrist is a liar, this is he taught you, you abide in him. So uh, conclude those two questions by uh, Brother Mark is that, that uh, every true believer uh, will, will receive and accept the teaching of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And part of why oftentimes people may be somewhat weak in their understanding and their inability to articulate uh the doctrine of the trinity because we don't have our, our we don't we don't teach enough as and i say we i'm talking about the office of the pastor and, and and why we go verse by verse book by book because the great let me let me uh this was actually a verse that i was going to start off with tonight it was out of matthew 28 and we were talking about this last night are y'all with me still wave your hand if you're with me still Okay, yeah, I'll go off on tangents. Uh, Matthew 28, we're familiar with the Great Commission. Uh, Jesus meets the disciples. He says, all authority in heaven and earth, Matthew 28, 18, all authority in heaven and earth has been given unto me. Go, therefore, right? Uh, go, and, and really the participle is, as you go, make disciples of all nations, right? Make disciples baptizing him in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So if we, uh, taking with the apostolic approach was, as they were sent out to be witnesses, as they went along, they made disciples by proclaiming the gospel, and they baptized those who believed upon Christ in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, verse 20, teaching them to observe all, not some, not a few, all that I commanded you and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. The one thing that is missing in the church today is that instead of making disciples, we make converts. And what, what a convert is, is someone gets saved, they come forward, they, they repeat a prayer, and then there's no follow-up. And Or they might come and get baptized, and then there, there's no class, like a new members class, there's no follow-up to help them grow. Where does the part of making disciples connected to verse 20, teaching them, teaching who? The disciples to observe all I commanded you. So we're not, we're not making disciples to teach them all that Christ has commanded, i.e. the New Testament. Okay. And so uh, there's, there's, that's why there's so many questions. There's so much uh, uh, confusion concerning theology proper. Theology proper is who is God? The one that you say is saved you and that your Lord, who is he? And that, that to me is, is fundamental. It, it just begins the discipleship process. Who is this God that saved me? You just baptized me on Sunday, Pastor. You said the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That, you said name singular, but then in the singular name, there are three persons. There's three names you gave. What is that? Well, that's the doctrine of God's three in oneness, which is known under the Latin term Trinity. Trinity means three in unity. Okay. So we 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 need to, this Bible study is all for us to be able to, you all are disciples, you are learners. That's what the Greek word means. And you want to learn all that Jesus Christ has commanded you. Uh, not just the aspects of scripture that fascinate you, like in times and all of that, but all of the word of God. And so now, as we're in this study of what is Reformed theology, we're talking, we're talking about a history now and how we get the Bible and how we come to affirm these doctrines that we are talking about concerning the Trinity and articulating who Jesus Christ is. And, you know, we talked about those five foundations of what Reformed theology is centered on. It's centered on God. It's 
based on God's word alone, is uh, committed to faith alone, devoted to Jesus Christ. And so we need to understand that. We need to love God with all of our being, right? How do I love God with all our being? Well, the first commandment says, love God with all your mind. And that means you got to think, okay? You just can't feel. You got to think. Love God with all your mind. That means we got to be students of scripture. We got to study to show ourselves approved. Love God with all your mind and your soul and your heart and your strength, okay? So it doesn't mean that we don't have emotions, but our emotions just can't be uh, uh, disconnected to truth. You know, I get happy when I talk the word of God because I understand. I understand now this great salvation and you can't help but to be immersely stirred in light of all that God has done for us in Christ, particularly knowing that as sinners, what we really deserve. And God, by his grace, saved us in Christ and brought us together. I mean, Sunday for myself personally, I mean, Romans 8 is my favorite chapter in the Bible. And I'm just fascinated at the thought that, and there are moments we can all testify when we've been weak, when we've been discouraged, when we have been uh, uh, disheartened about something. And we just, we know we need to pray, but we just can't get it out. And the spirit, uh, without you even having to tell him, he will automatically, your helper will know because he's always searching your heart, what it is that you stand in need of. And he'll talk to Jesus for you. And Jesus will talk to the father on your behalf. And the father, because he never denies the prayer of the, of the, of the spirit and his son, he'll always give you what is good and work it out for your good. That, that you get that in your heart and your mind, uh, it, it starts moving you to love God even more, right? Amen. Loving God, knowing God. And so all of this is not just an exercise of just going through the motions of Bible studies on Tuesday. I'm going to get the Bible study. I got to get the Bible study and, and browbeating people. No, you ought to want to have a desire to know God with all your mind more because this is the mission control center of the Christian life. It's as a man thinks within himself, so he is. As it says in Proverbs, I need to think God's thoughts after him if I want to experience the peace of God, the joy of God, the love of God in my life. Are you hearing me tonight? Uh, Romans chapter 12, verse two, be not conformed to this world. So why is Bible study essential? Because best believe the battle that we go through day in and day out is that we have a, a world around us that is so intrusive. They will force you to think the way that they think and the way that they think is anti-God. And so Paul says, you don't let the world squeeze you into its mold, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may know God's good and perfect and acceptable will. You know, we're aimless if we don't know God's will. We're lost if we don't know God's will. We are susceptible, susceptible to being led astray if we don't know God's will, okay? And that's a boldness that will come in your life um, where, where we know God's will, and, and, and uh, this is taking a Bible study, but I hope this is helping, but this is practical. Uh, for me as, as a Christian, for me as a husband, as a father, as a pastor, the one thing that, uh, and I, I, I'm going to base this statement off a statement out of Acts 24, and, 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 and let's bring it up for you. Um, when I know God's good and perfect and acceptable will, um, is Acts 24, 16. When I know God's good and perfect and acceptable will, I can live a life not confused or regretful when I do God's will. All that matters at the end of the day is, am I in the will of God? Notice this statement by Paul. This is Paul's, I would say, life statement. Verse 16 of Acts 24. In view of this, I also do my best to, main, to maintain always a blameless conscience before God and before men. That's that, that, that was the whole of his life. How do you maintain a blameless conscience? Well, I just, if I do God's will um, vertically and in my relationships on a horizontal level, I got a clear conscience. Don't mean I'm perfect, 
my conscience doesn't accuse me, you know? Um, now, I'm in a public office as a pastor, and there's always going to be public criticism. Um, and I can't run throughout the city of Lexington and beyond concerned about what people say about me. At the end of the day, I have to say, did I do God's will? If my conscience is clear, okay. And that's what you all ought to strive for. Uh, there's the hardships in life. I could have done better as a as a parent. I could have done better raising my child. But did did I do my con? Did I was my intent was to point my children to Jesus? Yes, I I prayed for them. I I, I did devotions with them. I took them to church. My conscience is clear. You know they can't come and raise their fist at me. No son, no daughter. I raised you to know Jesus. That's 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 how you want to live. Just a blameless conscience. I, I, I didn't do you no wrong. And, and when I did do you wrong, I made sure I came back and asked for forgiveness. My conscience is clear. I didn't seek to live as a hypocrite before you. I, I didn't seek to live fake before you. My conscience is clear. And our relationships with one another, to, to always maintain a blameless conscience. Con blameless conscience means I am sensitive to when my conscience convicts me when I know I'm outside of God's will and I'm quick to maintain short accounts. Doesn't mean perfection. It just means sensitivity to what I know is right before God and to seek to do that before him and before others. That's really what our focus and aim ought to be, amen? And we got to leave the results up to the Lord. I can't control tomorrow. I can't control my circumstances, but I can. I am responsible. You and I are responsible for our attitude before God. And we're to love him with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. I don't know how I got into all that, but... Uh, but I trust that that is something that we need to hear tonight in regards to our walk before the Lord. Amen. Amen. Okay. Any questions at this point? Any need for elaboration, clarification of what I've just stated? Okay, great. Natasha, I got Natasha saying that was good. That was great, Pastor. All right. All right. I'm glad to help with that. Okay. Now, with our notes, we're not going to dive into the notes, but I want to do this as we conclude tonight. Uh, you have the notes on uh, uh, on the church website. Let me clarify, and we'll get into the to the covenants next week. Let me say this important statement, because the question that is always in the back of my mind, when I used to teach high school, Sunday school, uh, the burden as I was preparing my lesson was always thinking, what are the high schools going to think they're going to say, so what? So what? So why is this important? And I always wanted to answer the so what. Why are we going through this section of covenant theology? So what, Pastor? So that you'll understand why as a church and understand what certain denominations teach and where you want to be anchored in the understanding of what the Bible teaches. In covenant theology, there are two teachings that really going to stand out to us. Number one is pedo baptism. Pedo baptism is another way of saying infant baptism. I did a baby dedication a couple of weeks ago for a Jamaican family uh, that professes Christ as their Lord and Savior. And I shared with them that this is, a, this is not a christening. This is not conferring any special saving grace on the child. A baby dedication is simply a vow that the parents made before God to raise your children in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. What we're going to learn in covenant theology is that there are reformed theologians that teach that just as the Old Testament saints circumcised their sons, that the New Testament, there's a continuity, there's a continuation where babies born into a Christian home ought to be baptized. And they call it infant baptism or pedo baptism. We're not pedo baptists We don't believe in the baptism of children, okay? We are credo-baptists. What is a credo-baptist? Credo, creed. There's a creed that we believe before we got to be baptized. What's that creed? Well, you got to believe that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, that he died on the cross for your sins. Are you a Christian? Yes, I'm a Christian. I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And they make that public profession and they get baptized. That's one aspect of what I want to help you understand what covenant theology is so that people ask we say well do you believe god is sovereign yes i believe that god saves and holds and keeps and and that christ died for those who believe upon him well are you a covenant theologian you're like no why would you disagree with covenant theology well i don't hold an infant baptism 
And I do not hold, secondly, to the church replacing Israel. Boom. Okay. So everything that I'm going to say, and I'm just going to explain a little further uh, next week, is that's the reason why we don't believe in covenant theology. We don't hold to infant baptism. We believe that when your child is born in your house as a Christian, there is a sanctifying influence of your life upon that child. It doesn't make that child in the covenant until that child believes upon Jesus. Uh, they would say that, yeah, they got to believe upon Jesus, but this water makes it such that they're in the covenant. Uh, and if they died in the, in the house of a Christian, they go to heaven. Uh, but if a child, a baby is in the house of a pagan, they don't, they're not covered. They're not in the covenant. I don't believe that. I believe that God is gracious and merciful uh, to save babies, uh, whether they're in a Christian home or an atheist home or, or, a, uh, or a Muslim home. Um, you know, you go back and read, and I'm almost done. You go back and read Jonah, last chapter of Jonah. When Jonah was upset that God spared Nineveh, and God says, should I not have compassion? I think it's like 200,000 who don't know their right from their left. Who is he referring to? Children. Children. Uh, the one that always gets me is David in 2 Samuel 12, when the Lord says the child to whom was born to him in Bathsheba will die. And uh, the child died seven days later. Now, you go back and read the Abrahamic covenant, the child was to be circumcised, the male child was to be circumcised on the eighth day. This child died on the seventh day, so they weren't circumcised. The child wasn't circumcised. What happened to that child? Were they in the covenant? Because they weren't circumcised? Circumcision was really an act of faith for the parent, not for the child. It was the parent believing in the Abrahamic covenant and giving their child, their son, the sign of that covenant. It did more for the parents than it did for the child. Can I give you one more example? Because I got three witnesses. I'm going to milk it. Remember Moses was called by God to go back to Egypt to rescue the, uh, the, the Israelites out of Egyptian bondage. Remember Zipporah came and with him and she was upset with Moses. In fact, no, it says, the text says in, in Exodus 4, the Lord was about to take Moses' life. And Zipporah, something happened where God was coming after Moses. And Zipporah hurried up and circumcised their son and threw the foreskin at Moses' feet. What was going on? Where well, Moses had failed to exercise faith in the God of the Abrahamic covenant by circumcising his own son. And he's going to go back and fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant and not exercise faith in that covenant, God was upset. It's hypocrisy. And therefore, now that the Lord didn't come after the son and try to kill the son for not being circumcised, he came after the daddy for not demonstrating faith in that covenant. Okay? So as I conclude, basically just understand two things if you don't get anything else about what, what covenant theology does believe that we would differ. They believe in the child um uh, uh the child uh born into a christian home is in the covenant and they 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 give the symbol of that covenant of baptism and they believe that the church replaces israel there was one comment i just saw come up pastor did you you did not complete your thought on david's child okay uh i didn't complete, uh, thank you for that uh david's child died even though he wasn't circumcised he went to heaven why? Because David said, after he heard the, day, the, the baby died, he stopped fasting, and he said, he cannot come to me, but I will go to him. That was David's faith. Can't come back to me, I will go to him. What does that mean? When I die, I'm going to go to him. Where is he at? He ain't in hell. He's in heaven. So thank you for that. Who would have said that? You know, I get off and I forget. But that, that was David's faith. Uh, and that's what I believe that every child uh, by God's grace and mercy, brings them to heaven. All, and I made this statement in my preacher's sermon on abortion this past summer, that 19 million black babies that have been aborted are in heaven. And more babies that have been aborted, they all are in glory. They're in the presence mm -hmm. of Jesus. So, so, so Pastor, the Israelites actually believed that you weren't in the covenant until the eighth day. So people would assume that if that child on the seventh day, he wouldn't be in the covenant? Is, is uh, they would say that, um, I'm saying in light of what those would say, 
That's a good question. Um, I, I would say that obviously circumcised the eighth day was the sign of being in the covenant. And then Paul refers to himself like that in Philippians. I'm circumcised size the eighth day. I'm, I'm, in, I'm an Israelite, a true Israelite. And you will not consider a true Israelite unless you were circumcised. That's the whole debate in the early church, that the Gentiles are not circumcised. They're not in the covenant. And Paul is saying the true circumcision is not of the flesh, but of the, of the heart, the circumcision of regeneration. So they got caught up in the sign and using the sign as a sign of salvation. And it's like, no, that's just a sign. It doesn't confer anything. You got to believe. And so, and that's where we get into all of this subject, but that's what the Jews believed during Jesus' time. You don't have to believe. You just got to have the sign of the circumcision. No, you got to come. Here's the last verse. Here's the last statement. And you just read Romans 4. Was Abraham saved when he believed in the Lord? Was he saved before circumcision or after circumcision? And I want you to be Bible scholars. I want you to research. Was Abraham, did he become a believer before he was circumcised or after he was circumcised? Because that's the, that's the argument that Paul makes in Romans 4. Okay? So I want you to give me the answer, Lord willing, next week. Was Abraham was he a believer before circumcision or after circumcision so that we'll understand the purpose of circumcision, okay? All right, answer that for me. And I already gave you a verse to go back and study, Romans chapter four, amen? Amen. Thank you for uh, tuning in tonight. Thank you for your questions. I hope this was helpful. I hope it was beneficial for you. Uh, again, you have additional questions. You have our email address. Uh, please come, let's make it a habit. Next week, we'll, we'll meet via Zoom because of another basketball game. Make it a habit. This is a part of your own personal investment and well as church uh, benefits from us gathering together, getting in the word, and getting our minds renewed. Amen. Uh, before we conclude, there, I want to encourage you in giving. You know our three uh, points of giving. We want to pray, pray, pray that Lord enables us to be able to pay off the chapel this year. Uh, we want to do that. We want to be a debt-free church. So you know, online giving, mail-in offering, and drop-off. So we pray. We pray to God. God will move in a mighty way, right? That he will bless us. So let's be faithful in our giving towards the chapel. And I believe that's it. That's it. So thank you for tuning in. Let us conclude our time in prayer. Amen. Let's conclude our time in prayer. Father, we bless you, Lord. We thank you for uh, your word. And I pray that our hearts and minds are being renewed as we're studying uh, the great truths of the scripture, that we would be uh, Bereans, that we would be wise uh, as serpents, harmless as doves, that we would be maturing in the faith and not be children tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, but that we will grow up in all aspects into Christ. I, pray, I thank you, for, Lord, for the saints. I pray that you would provide for their needs, that you would not allow their faith in you to fail, that you, that you would uh, guide them and guard them and watch over them. Uh, both physically and spiritually, that you would give us a thirst for the word that we may grow in respect to salvation, that you would not only show us our sins, but convict us of our sins and turn us towards righteousness, that we might receive the joy and the peace and the clearness of conscience to serve you, O oh God, without regret. Help us to love one another just as you have loved us, Lord Jesus. Thank you for our time. Thank you for uh, our, our moment that we can have together in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Love you, Main Street.